This is the Mathematics Education Podcast from MathEdPodcast.com. Welcome to the Math Ed Podcast. My name is Sam Otten from the University of Missouri, and I'm joined today by my colleague from the University of Missouri, James Tarr. James, thanks for being here. Good to be here. Thank you. James is going to be talking with me about his article with the uh, Research Council from NCTM. Their article is in the current issue of JRME. It's entitled, New Assessments for New Standards, the Potential Transformation of Mathematics Education and Its Research Implications. But before we get to the article, um, as usual, James, if you've been listening to the podcast, I like to ask people about their grad school experiences. So I was wondering if you could just say a little bit about your dissertation. My dissertation focused on middle school students' probabilistic reasoning, um, specifically in conditional probability and independence. And who did you, uh, where did you do that dissertation? Who did you work with? Uh, I'm the proud alumnus of, the, of Illinois State University. And my, I guess I want to give credit to my dissertation co-supervisors, um, Graham Jones and John Dossie. But I also want to express my gratitude to the other members, Jane Swafford and Cindy Langrell. Um, at the time, Cindy Langrell was a new professor in math ed, and um, it's now 16 years later, she is the editor of JRME. Mm-hmm. And if listeners pick up the current issue of JRME uh, in Volume 44, the March issue, they'll see a research commentary from the NCTM Research Committee, and that's the article that we're going to be discussing. But, James, I was wondering if you could uh, first just describe for us the Research Committee and their functions and purposes. Well, uh, the NCTM Research Committee uh, has several uh, kind of key functions. Um, First is to advise the NCTM Board of Directors. Second, um, it is to disseminate ideas to teachers that have been investigated by researchers. Um, Third is to collaborate with other groups to identify research topics to inform decision-making. And fourth is to co-sponsor and organize the NCTM Research Precession. So members of the NCTM Research Committee are myself, um, Erica Walker, Karen Hollibrands, Catherine Cheval, Chris Rasmussen, and Cliff Knold. Now, there are two other co-authors um, who are not members of the research committee, but uh, nevertheless uh, contributed to this manuscript. Robert Berry uh, is the NCTM board liaison to the research committee, and Karen King at the time was the staff liaison uh, to the research committee. Okay, so this article comes in the environment where we're really starting to move towards Common Core Standards. There's lots of changes happening, really a lot going on in math education. Uh, And you take as your key topic the issue of assessment, but I imagine there were some other things that you also considered. And so as a committee, how did you end up arriving at this issue of assessment as the one that you'd really focus on for the article? Right. Well, part of what the research committee does is to offer a research commentary for publication in JRME each year. And the topic of that is is up to the committee, but um, we chose assessment um, actually as the topic from a set of four possible topics. Um, what I did is I met with the JRME editor, Cindy Langrell, a member of the editorial panel for JRME, the board liaison to the research committee and NCTM staff liaison to the research committee. And and we discussed four potential topics. One is assessment. Another is mathematical modeling. Another is technology in math education. And uh, the fourth is equity in math education. Now, it was brought to my attention that the issue prior to the March uh, issue of Jeremy in which this commentary appears The January issue is focused on equity. It's a special issue. So we took that one off the table. Um, Modeling and technology were judged to be um, really not as as hot of a topic as um, assessment and especially the the forthcoming high-stakes assessments that are under development. Mm -hmm. And if listeners are interested particularly in equity, we do have a couple episodes from that special equity issue. People can look at episode 1304, 1305, just a quick plug. Mm -hmm. So with assessment being the focus area of this research commentary, um, there are a lot of innovations going on right now, a lot of changes that are coming just around the corner. 
in the era of Common Core, it's not just a change in curriculum, but there are going to be uh, new high-stakes formal assessments um, and actually new assessments across the board. So I was wondering if you could describe for some of those innovations in assessment, things like distributed design, adaptive testing, and also the technology-enhanced assessments. Right. Well, um, first of all, I think, you know, when you say assessment, what, what comes to mind is a paper and pencil test, um, some kind of summative assessment, a high-stakes assessment. And, and that's understandable, certainly um, in this era in which um, teachers and schools are being evaluated by performance data, um, tests you know, come to mind when you think of assessment. Mm -hmm. Um, But assessment is much more broad than summative assessment. So um, the distributive design design notion, um, the two assessment consortia are developing really a suite of tools to enhance the quality of mathematics instruction and produce um, greater learning. Among those are formative assessments that are, are not high stakes through course quarterly summative assessments, and then, of course, the comprehensive end-of-year exams. So it's really a a suite of tools, um, especially the formative assessments that provide information about whether students are learning, sometimes in real time, so that teachers can make decisions um, on the fly uh, to inform where they go next with instruction. Mm -hmm. And then... The suite does still include summative assessment, but those are going to look a little bit different. Actually, they might look quite a bit different from the summative high-stakes assessments in the past. One of the big differences is the use of technology, and so in the article you talk about technology-enhanced assessments. Could you just say a little bit more about those? Right. Well, even, even so some of these are interrelated, like adaptive testing and, and technology-enhanced assessments. Um, you know, traditionally, historically, we've administered exams Um, as paper and pencil tests where every student gets the same questions um, or they're they're answering questions uh, from the same set of questions. Now in this new era um, they're developing thousands of of items, the assessment consortia are, and the notion of adaptive testing is that a student will answer a question and if, if it's a difficult question and the student gets it wrong, the next question the student answers is an easier question. Uh, now, if the student gets that question wrong, then an even easier question is, is offered next. So the question, um, the set of questions that a given student answers will likely be very different based on the success the student is having with each subsequent item. In doing so, um, you're able to map that student onto a scale, and you can do that despite having different items that that students within a a class or a school experience. The tests are are not paper and pencil. They're uh, taken on a computer so that um, uh, the technology allows uh, the computer to decide which question um, the student is fed next. Mm -hmm. And just as I'm envisioning the students moving through the sets of questions, so they'll move across the same content theoretically, Mm -hmm. um, but they'll be kind of rising and falling in the difficulty. So it's not like they'll get, if they fail on a question or they get the question wrong, um, the next question might be easier, but it's it still might move to new content. It'll just be new content that is now easier or new content that's more difficult depending on how the student responds. Right. Well, um, they're they're using matrix sampling. So, you know, you can't have a single test test all of the content. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you're you're sampling uh, from the set of content. So, you know, if you, you don't do well on the first item and it's a geometry item, your next item may be an easier item, but it may not be a geometry item. It could be a, a, you know, an algebra item or a number and operations item. Okay. So you get, yeah, really the student is kind of traversing through the two dimensions, which is where the content is varying, but then also by the adaptive testing program, the difficulty is also kind of trying to move along with the student. Yes. Um, as for the technology enhanced assessments, um, these I I will admit that it was challenging to write the article because a lot of the details um, 
including sample items and you know professional development modules, are, are still in development. And so we we didn't have a whole lot to go from except you know uh, narrative about what is being promised. So you know, for example, the technology enhanced assessments. These are to include you know complex tasks that that. Um, can measure students' higher order thinking and, and some of the standards for mathematical practice, but we didn't have access to samples of these. So we speak about what is being promised without offering you know specific um, examples thereof. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, um, there are technology enhanced um, constructed response items and uh, we do offer an example from Park. In this item, students can manipulate sliders and see the effect of each transformation on on the graph of the function. In the end, students are to enter the coordinates um, for three different points that are um, being mapped under this transformation. And we were we were fascinated by it because students are to receive feedback on their answers. And I think what struck us is the nature of that feedback. If if you get the answer partially correct or completely incorrect, um, you, you receive the same feedback, uh, namely that your answer is incorrect. So uh, the, the task itself, I thought, raised a lot of questions that research can answer. And we offer some discussion around that item. But we do encourage readers to actually visit, you know, follow the link and engage in the task and, and just see what kind of questions um, doing so stimulates. Mm-hmm. And the interesting thing that's stuck out to me about that item is the way that the student uses the technology, the way that they actually move the sliders to you know, transform this function, that's not assessed at all. It's just their answer um, which to me, I, as a researcher, I would be interested in how the student uses the technology. But of course, that's a different purpose than right. Park has for the item. But. Well, and there is a second part to this task. Um, I want to be clear about that. We couldn't include both parts. But in communicating with Park, um, they ask that we include both p- portions of this. But mm-hmm. uh, for space, we, we just couldn't do that. Mm-hmm. Now, you've touched a little bit on how uh, some of the new assessment strategies are trying to get at some of the mathematical practices, trying to get at some conceptual understanding, but can you say a little bit more about the fact that at least what's being promised with the new, the new era of assessment is a, a movement beyond procedural skill to an actual high-stakes assessment of conceptual understanding and mathematical practices and those types of things? Well, first of all, I think it's exciting that we can uh, value... Um, types of knowledge beyond procedural knowledge, so conceptual understanding and and problem solving. So what we mentioned in the article is that um, these items promise to provide information about the standards for mathematical practice. I think we're we're a little skeptical that we'll be able to, um, that these items will be able to deliver in that regard because Understandably, we expect several of the mathematical practices to be interrelated, and so you know, disentangling those and, and measuring them well, I think, will be a, a real challenge. Mm-hmm. But it's at least exciting that the conversation is moving in that direction. Even, I mean, it's kind of a happy challenge to have to try to assess those things in a rich, robust way. Right. Exactly. I think back on you know, Iowa Test of Basic Skills that uh, research a generation ago. I mean, more than um, 85% of the items focused on number and operation, and it was primarily procedural knowledge. So mm-hmm. uh, we're very pleased with the notion that um, the new assessments can value um, the things that we've been pushing in math education for, for a long time. Mm-hmm. I'm speaking with James Tarr from the University of Missouri, and we're talking about the article that's in the current issue of JRME, which is entitled... New Assessments for New Standards, The Potential Transformation of Mathematics Education and Its Research Implications. This is the commentary from the NCTM Research Committee. So the article really lays out some of the innovations that are happening in assessment, um, which are very compelling and interesting things that are going on in math education. But one thing that the article really contributes to the field is a push in certain directions or an identification of research needs, 
where we need to really kind of take advantage of this tidal wave um, and really also try to understand the changes that are happening because they are so profound and they're going to have you know very large impacts on school districts and on math teachers and math students. Um, so I'm going to ask you to, to talk about some of those research implications and some of the su suggestions for future work. You break them down into different domains, so maybe first starting with the mathematics curriculum domain. Right. Well, uh, with regard to mathematics curriculum, um, one thing that we, we suggest is exploring teachers' awareness and interpretation of the new standards. A, a learning goal stated in Common Core may be interpreted differently by different teachers and then to enact instruction to meet that standard um, is likely going to produce substantial variation in the kinds of instruction that, that teachers offer. So um, one is, is simply teachers' awareness and interpretation of the standards. Um, mm -hmm. But we also um, put in a plug for uh, whether these new standards are preparing students better for collegiate mathematics. It's, these standards are you know, college and career readiness standards. And clearly some research opportunities um, abound with um, the extent to which Common Core uh, is preparing students for college-bearing courses. Mm -hmm. um, you also talk about some research needs or some suggestions for research and instruction, so I was wondering what you have in that area. Well, um, certainly the standards for mathematical practice mm -hmm. are um, an avenue for a vast amount of research in the, in the coming years. So just characterizing the prevalence of the mathematical practices, um, you know, which ones are, are being used most commonly by teachers and why, um, which ones are less evident and why. Um, but also with regard, to, especially to the uh, technology-enhanced assessments, mm -hmm. um, you know, in what ways do students interpret the feedback they get and in what ways do teachers process the information regarding student learning? So if these assessments deliver information in real time in an efficient manner to teachers about whether students are learning, the question is, um, and this is what we suggest for an avenue of research, um, how are teachers interpreting and processing that information and how are they using it to inform instruction? Mm -hmm. And that's referring to uh, practicing teachers, but then we also have the issue of preparing teachers now for this new kind of arena of math education that they're going to be getting into. So there's pre-service teacher education and also in-service teacher education. Right. Well, um, I think research shows that an effective learning environment includes, among other things, um, an assessment-centered uh, environment in which teachers are constantly monitoring whether students are learning and then using that feedback to inform what happens next. Um, so as we prepare teachers, we certainly need to prepare them for this, this new classroom environment in which these evolving technologies provide information in real time as to whether students are, are learning. And I think that's a, a real challenge for uh, teacher education in, in the coming years. Not that it's altogether new, but certainly um, learning how to orchestrate um, classroom uh, discourse uh, classroom discussions, um, using effective questioning techniques, and um, you know, selecting and adapting tasks. These are not altogether new um, arenas for research, but you know, it's certainly with new standards and new assessments, uh, that type of research um, is is very much needed. Mm -hmm. And I think too. So you mentioned the classroom discourse, and I think through teacher education, helping teachers to see the role that classroom discourse plays in assessment, um, that it's not just about students talking for talking's sake, but that that's actually giving important information to the teacher about what the students are learning, what they're having trouble with. And then, as you mentioned, the fact that PARC in particular, but these new assessments, they actually have, they're developing tools that are going to be available for teachers to use in their classroom throughout the year in kind of preparation for the, the big cumulative assessment at the end of the year, but helping teachers to know how to use that. And to me, the exciting thing, too, is if, if these tools that the teachers can use are at a high level, if they're maybe getting that conceptual understanding or trying to promote, if they're assessing the mathematical practices, then in a sense, they're also kind of promoting the mathematical practices or they're giving an opportunity Absolutely. to engage in the mathematical practices. And so then I think there's implications there 
for the teachers using those tools, but to me that really links to their instructional practices as well. Exactly. The other area, uh, domain of research, that we uh, lay out in the, in the commentary is related to equity. And this piece uh, offers uh, some suggestions for researching the role of equity at, at a macro level and a micro level. So at the macro level, I'll just mention that um, you know, documenting differences and disparities in technology access and use So we know there is a digital divide between high and low income school districts and and schools within a district. And, um, you know, accounting, you know, documenting those and accounting for those as we examine student performance across schools. Uh, That's one suggestion. And at the micro level is just looking at whether uh, Common Core is, is actually improving access to and opportunity for learning rigorous mathematics for all students, including English language learners. Mm -hmm. And now that's just touching on a few of the main themes in each of those four domains. In the article, there's uh, even a little bit more detail that the listeners can go and find, um, and maybe, you know, the listener can zero in on one of those domains that maybe they're most interested in. But really, it's it's an ambitious uh, push from the research committee for this work that needs to be done. And it's really, you know, we can't drag our feet either because this stuff is happening, so we kind of need to get moving. But what would you see as necessary for this to actually happen? I mean, because you have kind of, with this article, laid down a challenge to the field, um, and it's not, not going to be an easy one to take up. So what do you see needing to be in place for us to actually successfully move forward? Well, c- certainly one thing that struck us uh, as we were discussing various iterations of this manuscript, at the same time we were reviewing um, the feedback we received on more than 300 proposals for the re- NCTM research pre-session. Mm-hmm. Of those more than 300 proposals, only a handful, um, you know, maybe five or six, focused explicitly on issues related to assessment. Mm. And of those five or six, we accepted perhaps you know three or four. So I think you know, given that assessment is truly going to be a hot topic for research, um, we expect the number of proposals to increase in the, in the coming years. Um, what we call for is more partnerships between mathematics education and um, related disciplines. So, for example, educational measurement, statistics, psychology, including developmental psychology, um, so that we're not trying to take on this ambitious research agenda as as a field of math educators working in isolation. I think our greatest strength will be, you know, taking on some of these issues with people who, who probably all already have some perspective on this, such as those um, in educational measurement. Mm-hmm. Um, as for uh, what it would take to, you know, achieve the the goals that we've laid out, my short answer would be funding. Um, <laughs> but I do think that um, in concert with my, my earlier comment, um, increasingly the calls for um, research proposals um, are for interdisciplinary research. So um, suggesting that we work with people outside of math education, I, I think that would be fruitful in pursuing external funding to pursue some of the research that we suggest in the commentary. Mm -hmm. My guest is James Tarr from the Department of Learning, Teaching, and Curriculum at the University of Missouri, my colleague here from right down the hall. And James, before I let you go, I have a final question that I like to ask all my guests. If you can imagine a world in which you were not in a mathematics education career, so I'll give you a moment to (laughs) form that image, what would you see yourself doing? Wow, you saved the hardest question for last, I see. Thank you. (laughs) Um, so if the math ed thing doesn't work out, what I might Okay, this could say. be a future scenario if you okay. want to put it that way. <laughs> um, well, okay, so I, I'm going to go with, I think I'd be a meteorologist. Um, there's still a lot of math involved in that, in mm-hmm. forecasting, um, notions of uncertainty and probability. Mm-hmm. And plus the weather affects us uh, every day. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'll go with meteorologist. And it's a, you've picked a nice time to bring up that that potential career because we just went through a storm at the end of the last week, and we might have another one right around the corner. Right. We are under a winter storm warning as we're being recorded. <laughs> James, thanks so much for being here with me. Thank you, Sam.
Thank you for listening to this episode of the MathEd Podcast. If you'd like to support the podcast financially, please use the PayPal donation button at mathedpodcast.com.